Okay, right. Um, I think this is going to be a fairly rapid um, outline of um, HS2's approach to the historic environment, which is essentially enshrined in a document that we call HERDS, um, which is a historic environment research and delivery strategy. Um, essentially, the, um, the sheer scale of HS2 has it hasn't forced us, but it's, it's given us an opportunity to think about how archaeology and heritage are done at such a large scale. Um, and it's provided an opportunity, really, to maybe think differently about how we do archaeology on a scheme of this size. So I'll just hand over to Emma. Oh. Yeah, I'll just hand over. <laughs> Return and back space. So I'm sure most of you are aware of uh, HS2, but for those that aren't that familiar with the scheme, um, it's approximately around 230 kilometres long, stretching from London to north of Birmingham at Litchfield, going into the city centre. Um, as a bit of a comparison, uh, compared to High Speed 1, which is about 108 kilometres, this is um, nearly twice the length of Phase 1. It avoids topographic extremes and heavily built up areas, apart from obviously Birmingham and London, but it does cross a variety of geological strata and superficial deposits. So the Heritage Memorandum sets out the commitments to heritage and is part of the environmental minimum requirements. HERDS is the mechanism for delivering the heritage commitments for the scheme. And this sits beneath the Heritage Memorandum. Um, we have things like WSIs and the project plans uh, that form part of that delivery. So the key principles, the heritage works need to fit clearly within a defined budget and programme, which is with ma any major infrastructure project and it will deliver commitments whilst also providing public benefit. This is done through enhancing knowledge and creating a lasting legacy. Okay, so just to talk about the innovative approach. Um, the strategy will be question-led, so essentially a series of um, established research questions will actually um, drive field work, the heritage work, the recording work, all the way through the programme, all the works um, linked back to those questions. So unlike, well, the, the, we've got something like 49 questions that we've set out so far, so it's quite an extensive um, amount of questions that we've uh, established. So in order to achieve that, obviously we need to um, share the knowledge and collaborate across the scheme. Um, the scheme is split essentially into three. Um, a southern, central, and uh, northern sections. Obviously, to be well, there are there are different tiers of contractors within that, um, and obviously, you know, this will this will um, include quite a large um, proportion of the archaeological um, resource workforce, essentially, that we have. Um, so it's very important that we that we talk and uh, collaborate on, on a route wide level. Um, one of the things um, to enable us to achieve that is a digital platform um, which we're developing at the moment which will have um, a kind of um, online portal, a web-based portal, a GIS, but I'll talk a bit more about that later. Um, so essentially the scheme, one, one big difference as well with, um, um, between what we're doing in development-led archaeology um, is that the schemes of work will be designed by the archaeological contractors so it gives the contractors the opportunity to think about the research questions, how they might be able to address those, and think in it innovatively about how best those um, questions can be addressed through, through, um, through the works. And it encourages methodological innovation. So although we have a series of technical standards, and obviously there will be a lot of standard methodologies used, um, basically, you know, we'd like to see different methods tested and, and, and there's a process, there's a departures process for that to review any, any different um, techniques that are put forward. So we have a series of headline objectives which kind of set out the kind of ethos really for this. Um, so obviously addressing current um, research questions is one. And obviously with, um, with having a kind of question led and research focused approach um, we hope to be able to inspire the next generation of historic environment professionals. Obviously the sheer scale of the scheme will draw people in, um, but you know, there's, there's clearly potential to create new jobs, attract graduates and inspire people to move into the profession and that's one of the kind of, um, you know, 
key elements of the uh, of the strategy. So I've talked about testing and developing um, new methods, and to address um, existing techniques as well, to assess existing techniques and their effectiveness. Another important strand is to engage with local communities. So communities in a, obviously a kind of geographic sense, but also professional academic communities as well. And obviously all this has to be done within a, a fixed cost, budget and time scale in, in the same way as any other um, large project. It has to be defined, it can't be just an undefined research project that um, essentially eats up resources and time. Um, okay, so this is just a snapshot of the processes that we have in place. We've got the ethos, the headline objectives. Um, we've got a series of technical standards and procedures. We've got specific objectives, which are much more detailed than the headline ones that I've just spoken about. And we have different mechanisms for the delivery of the work. So we have project plans and location-specific WSIs which I'll talk about later, which essentially set out the methodology um, and you know, the method statements for the work. So that all feeds into our online um, portal, the GIS. It will feed into an ongoing review of the resource assessment. Obviously, we have a resource assessment, but as work progresses, that will change because there will be discoveries, there will be things that we didn't expect not just one-off discoveries, patterns across the route at route-wide scale. And it all feeds into the final deliverables. Okay, so we've set out a series of um, knowledge creation objectives. Um, so I'm just going to run through how we actually got to, the, got to that point. Um, obviously, there was a very large environmental statement done for HS2, which involved a lot of archaeological desk-based assessment work. So obviously, you know, we looked at that, we revisited that. Um, we brought in, into play all the current regional resource assessments and research frameworks that were available. Um, looked at all the kind of priorities and, well, we tried to look at all the questions, but I think it came to something like 40 pages when we summarised them. <laughs> 40 pages of questions, uh, bullet, bullet pointed questions. Um, and academic publications, um, grey literature, and everything else. Um, so we did a really kind of robust resource assessment before we um, tried to set out our specific objectives. And as part of that, we held um, a series of consultation um, workshops. We brought in local authority archaeologists, um, representatives from the academic community, professional archaeologists, um, archaeological units, and various specialists to um, essentially and Historic England um, to discuss gaps in knowledge where people saw um, that the actual research priorities were. So essentially we tried to distill what exists within a mass of um, um, questions within the research, existing research frameworks. Okay, so every piece of um, every piece of um, archaeological work that takes place will, as I say, will um, will be identified for investigation on the basis of addressing specific objectives. So it's not necessarily the case that we're going to look at every piece of potential archaeology and record it because it exists. We have to have a robust set of objectives, knowledge creation objectives that the work links back to and the methods employed will be designed to address those questions. So HERDS it justifies the investigations essentially by um, on the basis of advancing understanding and that's where um, the public benefit comes in as well. So um, from the kind of 40 odd, 50 odd specific objectives that we've got um, they're set out at different scales we've, we've tried to cover a whole you know, the whole sort of variety of archaeological periods, um, some of which lend themselves more to a scheme-wide approach, others are more location-specific for known, known sites, and some, and some are regional and relate to regional um, questions and research priorities. So this is just an example, um, a flavour of what we have. So um, 
you know, the location of Paleolithic deposits, reconstru reconstruction in past environments, so these are scheme-wide objectives, looking at settlement patterns, um, lithic scatters and the like for the Mesolithic, Neolithic and Early Bronze Age, uh, thinking about approaches to how we address that. Some more regional-based questions, looking at the high density of prehistoric settlement evidence in the Colm Valley. How representative is that? Is it a genuine focus of activity? Does it represent a fieldwork bias? Um, and different questions for different regions, looking at further north up the scheme, looking at the Trent Valley. Um, you know, adding to our knowledge of the sequence of settlement um, archaeology there, um, see if we can kind of identify any um, sort of precursors really to the Iron Age and Roman um, field systems and archaeology that we know about. And um, there are obviously a number of sites along the route that we uh, are very, uh, you know, we know quite a bit about already, but obviously we don't know everything about these sites. This is one, this is Coles Hill. Um, it's just on the edge of Birmingham, but it's in Warwickshire. Um, where we have a quite unusual moated site um, within that is a listed building um, and it was it's <coughs> there's, there's kind of possible medieval settlement remains there's Ridge and Furrow there's a deer park um, there's a whole kind of complex of um, medieval or early post medieval archaeology so and the route goes straight through this so this is one of our uh, priority sites uh, of those that we know of um, this is the uh, LiDAR data. We've got LiDAR for the whole route that was flown at quite high resolution. We've also done geophysical surveys along quite a, you know, over quite a large proportion of the route. Um, this is another one, Stoke Mandeville in Buckinghamshire. Um, basically here we have um, possible deserted medieval settlement but a definite um, abandoned church and um, graveyard um, which was abandoned in the 19th century. The church was, I don't think it was knocked down until the 1960s because it was an unstable ruin but it's actually mentioned in Doomsday Book and there's really high potential there um, for some really early burials essentially going right the way from sort of Doomsday right up to kind of 1900 I think is the last one. So Okay. Another example is we have um, there's a scheduled Roman villa at Edgecut, um, which is not within the scheme. It's outside the scheme. But so we need to characterise the um, archaeology around that. Um, we've done quite a lot of geophysical survey around that. I think there's actually more than this now. Um, but as you can see, it's very busy. There's a lot of archaeology there. If it was a Roman villa. Maybe it wasn't quite so isolated. There obviously looks like it's a multi-phase site anyway, so could be late Bronze Age, Iron Age as well. Thank you. Um, so one of the things that I'm primarily involved in with the project is looking at the geoarchaeology and the paleoenvironmental potential along the route. So one of the things that we're trying to do at the moment is look at these route-wide resource assessments. These are scheme-wide, basically detailed desk-based assessments of the geoarchaeology and the paleoenvironmental risks along the route to help us to assess the potential of the landscape. So the geoarchaeological one uh, particularly focuses on five major river valleys. These are the Colm, the Thames, the Blythe and the Col. But also we're going to be looking at the deposits associated with the pre-Anglican um, Bytham River. The aim is to identify key research themes, so very similar to how Herds was developed. So we're looking at areas where further work will be required, as well as characterising the deposits along the route to establish potential impacts. One of the uh, recommendations will be to help look at the different measures and mitigate possible impacts on sensitive deposits, as well as developing a geoarchological strategy for investigation along the route. The paleoenvironmental desk-based assessment is primarily concerned with the paleo sequences that contribute towards the knowledge and decision-making regarding the environmental archaeological potential. This is largely a resource assessment which will provide a database um, and this will help us to identify gaps in the knowledge and also gaps in the herd's objectives. This will allow for the prioritisation of resources as well as providing a robust framework for further work to continue. Okay, just to um, give a little bit more detail to the mechanisms, 
um, for the investigations. Um, so obviously, ordinarily within developer-funded archaeology, everybody's familiar with uh, written schemes of investigation. Um, for this, we kind of split them up slightly. So we have project plans, um, which are basically documents which set out the methods for investigation in any given location, but specifically refer back um, to the research questions. So there'll be a project plan for a piece of field work, whether it's a geophysical survey, an evaluation, whatever it might be. Um, but within that, it details which questions it's aiming to address. Um, and that could be, you know, at, at the appropriate scale, essentially, at different scales. Um, and the location-specific WSIs are defined by the actual construction package boundaries. So obviously, although HS2 is a huge linear project, it's parceled up into you know, all manner of different design elements. Um, so the WSIs um, bring together the project plans and detail how they're going to be implemented in terms of the program, the resources, health and safety, and, and some of the, also some of the technical detail as well that you might ordinarily find in a WSI. So it's a two-stage process. And the, um, Okay, this, this sort of gives you a bit of a flavour of the actual process. So the contractors will review the baseline knowledge for their area of the scheme. Um, they'll look at the specific objectives to see which are appropriate. Obviously, they'll need to uh, be fully conversant with all the technical standards for the methodologies and procedures. Um, then, there is, a, there is a stage where the contractors can essentially decide whether they think there's further pre-commencement works are required, if we need to do more, if more geophysical surveys necessary, and there's a process where it comes back to the employer for review and approval. And as part of that process, um, the local authorities are invited to comment and Historic England where appropriate as well. And those processes are all defined. Um, okay, so the digital workspace. Um, this is designed to facilitate the collaboration across the route. Um, as I said earlier, it will incorporate a GIS, so um, it will enable that kind of spatial review of ongoing field work and results. Um, there will be an ability for contractors to upload <coughs> interim reports, final reports. Um, data, you know, whatever the, whatever the data might be, geophysical excavation data, into this, and we can, we'll be able to query it, so we'll be able to look at which specific objectives are being addressed where, so we'll be able to kind of manage it in that sense, so that we, you know, so that we don't have a kind of concentration of activity looking for, you know, looking at some objectives in one part of the route and not, uh, and not the other, or, 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 or whatever the issue might be. Um, so as well as the GIS, there will be a web portal which will, which will enable documents to be uploaded. It will have links to research frameworks and um, other relevant stuff. And as a result of all this, the resource assessment that we have at the moment will actually be updated on the basis of ongoing results. And um, the contractors will have the ability to um, contribute to that and actually directly contribute to the update of that resource assessment subject to review um, but yeah um, this is an example of what we have at the moment um, this is the HS2 scheme wide um, online GIS system called GViewer um, at the moment it covers all disciplines all different um, elements of the engineering program um, so we're basically um, the idea is to have one of these just tailored to historic environment and um, which will have all the existing data on it the data that we have at the moment, new data, ongoing results. Again, we'll be able to filter it and query. So that's in the process of being developed at the moment. And last but not least, um, the communities. Obviously, it's very important. It's, a, it's, a, it's an important and significant opportunity to involve communities over a very large area um, of the country. Um, there are initiatives to engage with schools, colleges, youth, youth groups, students, and um, there is a 
basically a community engagement team within HS2, which is organised at the sort of level of the HS2 organisation, and um, the contractors will be working with with them to you know facilitate this essentially. And we have provided some specific objectives within herds as guidance, but um, it's not too prescriptive. There is the um, also um, we'd like to encourage people to come forward with their own ideas for research projects, whether that be community archaeology societies, higher education, academics. So given the scale of the scheme, there's obviously there's a, there's a big opportunity here to, for this. And that, that's just about it, really, the summary. Okay. <laughs>